Good morning. Good morning, everyone. And would you stand with me? Father, we have gathered in the, in the name of Jesus to worship you, uh, worship you, the Holy Spirit, in, in Jesus. Lord, it's all about you, what you have been doing. You initiate and draw us to you, Lord. It is you that we look to to guide us today. You're a merciful God, a gracious God. You're always at work. So we ask, Lord, that you would give us eyes to see you and know you and follow you wherever you take us. We cast our cares upon you. Just to trust and rest and enjoy the fellowship with you, with our brothers and sisters. Speak through your word today. In your precious name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. to you we honor you lord give you all the glory father you are our god and we love you because you first loved us lord thank you Oh 
Exalted and the train of his robe fills the temple with glory, and the whole earth is filled, and the whole earth is filled, and the whole next song uh, my youngest daughter taught me this song back in the 90s so So glad. 
so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. Thank you, Lord Jesus, Lord. Sorry. sins and grief to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Hallelujah. Let all that burden 
burdens you carry every day, man. Just God is so good. All the time. All the time. local boys in the crowd in the church. All the time. King of glory that pursues me with his love and haunts me with his fearing of his softly spoken words. His conscience a reminder of forgiveness that I need.
with your hope in God alone. Take courage in his power to save, completely and forever one. By Christ emerging from the Himself has paid the price. Let all who trust in Him today find healing in His sacrifice. Let all who trust. Thank you, Lord. We praise and honor you, Lord. Lord, we pray for the word today. Lord, uh, penetrate our hearts, Lord. We thank you and praise you, Lord, and honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Uh, just a few announcements before we get started. Uh, this week, I will not be teaching Lance. Uh, we're going to give a warm hand in a second. Um, it's taking a step of faith to step in the pulpit. Now, let me ask you a question. Does anybody else want to come up in this pulpit? It's kind of a nervous thing, and especially the first time. And, and you know, the, one of the goals of really a ministry is to raise up people and is to give opportunity because if people never get opportunity, they never will grow. And certainly he's going to grow us into the image and likeness of Jesus Christ. We understand that. But God wants us all to serve him, serve him in spirit and truth. So Lance will be teaching in a few moments, but I want to give a couple more updates. Next week, I'll be uh, teaching again. We'll be in the book of Revelation for two more weeks, and then I'm gone for two Sundays. Uh, Danny Lehman will be here one Sunday. Lance will be teaching one Sunday. The, the week that I come back, I will lead you guys through Israel, uh, because I'll be in Israel for, again, 
almost three weeks, but only two Sundays. And I will have a slideshow, walk you through, tell you the significance of this site and each site. Now, if Internet is available, I will be sending video clips of Israel and the greetings from Israel. But uh, I just want to kind of give you a heads up. Um, and then it's headed towards Easter. We've been cheated before by not being able to meet for Easter. But uh, hopefully this Easter Sunday, we will have a Resurrection Sunday like we haven't had for a long time. Amen. So I'm going to ask uh, Lance to come up here, and, and let's give him a warm hand. Let's pray and encourage him. Lance, don't let it go to your head, okay? Okay. <laughs> Father, we do pray for Lance that you would give him the boldness to speak when he needs to speak. And as I pray for myself, Lord, if there's anything that is not of you, Lord, hold it back. Put your words in his mouth. Lord, use him for your glory. Give us ears to hear, hearts that are open to you. In your precious name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you very much for the warm welcome. It's wonderful to be here. And while my computer's coming back on, I wanted to say a couple of things. My wife and I have been thinking about Hawaii for many years. We lived in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and uh, we're active there in Calvary, in Albuquerque, uh, but we really loved Hawaii, and we wanted to come here, and we had already been to most of the islands, and we decided that the Big Island was where we wanted to be, and uh, when we got here, we looked at houses on the west side and the east side and everywhere, and we finally decided to, to uh, live in Hilo, or outside of Hilo, south, just south of here, and then we came to church here, and I, we were just felt so welcome just immediately. I really thank you for that, and uh, thank you for letting me be a part of this church, and I look for, forward for a long time. Thank you so much. church in Taos, New Mexico, which is where I grew up, um, I remember this song that we sang pretty much every Sunday, and many of you may remember the words to this song. I'm not going to sing it because I don't have a great voice for that, but the words were very simple. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning, our song shall rise to thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty. God in three persons, blessed Trinity. That's quite a statement. God in three persons, blessed Trinity. It's been a statement and an ar a point of argument between churches and denominations for, for 2,000 years. And uh, I didn't really understand it at that time, and it took me many years before I really got into the Bible and really became saved when, was, when I was about 40. And uh, uh, since that time, I've done a lot of Bible studies and classes and done some teaching and what have you, and I've come to know that the Trinity, God in three persons, is very key. Um, in, your, uh, in your program this morning, inside the first page, I wanted you to look at that Trinity diagram. It's just a diagram. It's not a picture of God, but it was developed in the early church to help people understand the concept of the Trinity, of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, all being one God. And if you look at that diagram with me in the center, is God, and that's all God. But around that, there's the Father, there's the Son, and there's the Holy Spirit. And looking at the Father, it says Father is God, Father is not the Son, and He is not the Holy Spirit. Then you look over on the right to the Son, and the Son is God. God. He is not the Father around this curve there, and the Son is not the Holy Spirit. 
And thirdly, the Holy Spirit down there on the bottom, the Holy Spirit is God, but the Holy Spirit is not the Son, and the Holy Spirit is not the Father. Kind of an interesting concept. Uh, maybe that helps you solidify that thought a little bit, maybe not, but think about it, because when we see the Holy Spirit, uh, we see God. When we believe in Jesus Christ and his teachings and his word in the Bible, we see God's word as it's inspired by the Holy Spirit. And we know God. Now, to begin this lesson about the Holy Spirit, I want to read from the first two, two verses of Genesis. It says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. The Spirit of God is mentioned in the second verse of the Bible. And then if we go a little further, um, in Genesis 126 get my machine to work here hmm. can't get it to scroll up sorry It's got to start here for me. Hold on. Yeah, up there. Thank you. Then God said, let us make man in our image, our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created Man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him. Male, female, he created them. So we see that when God said, he didn't say, I'm going to make man in my image. He said, I'm going to make man in our image. He was speaking of more than just Father God himself. He was speaking about God the Son, Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit. And we know from uh, the first chapter of the book of John, where it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was, became flesh and dwelt among us, and he was uh, God, the Son of God, Jesus. This idea of the Holy Spirit is, is really quite a concept, and, and one idea that came to me a few years ago through a, through a pastor at Calvary by the name of uh, Dr. Uh, Nelson Walker, who taught the school of ministry there, and he, he, he gave me this idea, and then I saw it when I read this book that Danny Lehman, you all know Danny Lehman, he preached here just a month or two ago, in fact, that's who gave me this book, and here's what he says, and listen to this about the dance of the Holy Spirit, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Since God is eternal and uncreated, we must conclude that he has always been relating within himself as the Trinity from eternity past, sharing this other-centered centered relationship. Early, some early Christian mystics had described this sweet society of unselfish love that is between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as a divine dance in which each member is both a lead partner and a follower this is not a theological double talk. God has made us in his image to be like him, a human unity within diversity, with diversity, body, soul, and spirit. So if you can think about the Holy Spirit, Father God, the Son, the Holy Spirit, they existed from the very beginning. There was nothing else. But they were... Uh, in relationship with each other in such a loving way that they enjoyed themselves completely. And then they decided, well, why don't, and this, this next word is my opinion, we just, they decided, that, well, let's, let's share this 
love with someone else because we're just out here and nothing. So he created the earth and then he created mankind so that he could share this love that the three of them shared. He could, they could share with us, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. script so I'll just use it so going through the Bible starting with Genesis which we've already mentioned the Holy Spirit is mentioned and I'm going to show you that the Holy Spirit is with us throughout the Bible we see him a lot if we just look for him he's not a new concept he's always been there numbers 27 verse 18 to 20. So the Lord said to Moses, take Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the spirit, and lay your hands on him, and have him stand before Eliezer the priest, and before all the congregation, and commission him in their sight. You shall put some of your authority on him in order that all the congregations of the son of Israel may obey him. So we see here that the Lord tells Moses to get Joseph who, with whom the Holy Spirit was in. So Holy Spirit was there with uh, Joshua. Of course, he was there with Moses as well during his, his time in leading the Israelites out of Egypt. Under the leadership of God and the Holy Spirit, Joshua led Israel into their promised land where they lived in peace until they began to fall away from the Lord. If you know the history, that happened over a number of years after Joshua died and whatever. But in those days, there were no kings of Israel. They had no leaders. The people set aside God's laws and everybody did what was right in their own eyes and they really fell away from the Lord. For about 350 years, they existed this way without a true leader. And the nation suffered for this. Then we come to Judges 3, 9 to 11. It says, when the sons of Israel cried to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the sons of Israel to deliver them, Othniel the son of Kenez, Caleb's younger brother. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he judged Israel. So there's the Spirit of the Lord again, and he comes into Israel and helps that leader during this very time, difficult time. The names of the, of the judges, because this went on for 350 years, but they would come back to the Lord, and then they'd fall away, and then uh, a judge would, the Lord would raise up a judge, and he would, he would lead them back to the Lord and defeat their enemy or whoever had conquered them. Uh, the names of the other judges besides Othniel was Deborah, Gideon, Jephthah, Samson, and finally Samuel. Uh, Samuel was the last judge, and then he was the judge and prophet who actually anointed King Saul to become king of Israel. Going to 1 Samuel 16, verse 13, then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him, that is Saul, in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David. Excuse me, David. I missed that part here. Uh, unfortunately, Saul was the first king, but he was not a good king, and the Lord began to replace him with David over time. And so now Samuel anoints David. Now David was an exceptional king, as we all know, He's very much revered in Israel, and he's very much revered by the Jewish people. He was also known as the sweet psalmist of Israel, who wrote about 75 out of the 150 psalms that we find in our Bible today. Very talented man, great leader of Israel. Uh, God promised him that his descendants would rule Israel forever. Uh, that promise.
promise was partially fulfilled at, at the time that Christ was born because he was a descendant of uh, David. In uh, 2 Samuel chapter 23, the prophet Samuel quotes David and says, The Spirit of the Lord spoke by me, and his words were on my tongue. David gives the Holy Spirit credit for all that he wrote in the psalm. The Holy Spirit was upon him, and he wrote based on the direction of the Holy Spirit. This psalm is uh, one psalm that we can read is 139, 7 to 10. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in the show, behold, we are there. You are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, and even there your hand will lead me, and your right hand will lay hold of me. Near the end of his reign, David sinned very badly with Bathsheba. Maybe you know the story, maybe you don't, but he actually had a man killed out in battle so that he could marry his wife, who he had already had relationships with, and she was already pregnant. So that really severed his tie with, the God, with God, with the Holy Spirit. And he was a man who lived by the Holy Spirit, and now he committed this horrible sin, probably as bad a sin as anybody could ever commit. And it severed his relationship with the Lord, just kind of like you and I might do that if we commit, hopefully not that terrible a sin, but other sins that we all tend to commit, whether you can, you can name them, each one of us knows the sins we deal with and have to struggle with. And when we don't stay away from those sins, if we have a good relationship with the Lord and the Holy Spirit is with us, it quenches that spirit of the Lord. It, 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 it causes us to lose that close tie with the Heavenly Father and this through the Holy Spirit. And so we have, well, but fortunately the Lord and God knows we're going to do these things. But he's given us a way out because he tells us if we will repent of our sins, he is faithful and just and will fulfill us with all forgive us for all unrighteousness and even David could be forgiven for the terrible thing that he did and he knew this but it took him about a year and a friend of his by the name of Nathan also a prophet who who confronted him because the prophet Nathan knew somehow how what David had done by killing Uriah and then marrying Bathsheba uh, and so he came to David and he confronted him and then David realized what a terrible thing he had done, and so he repented. And we have in Psalm 51, the psalm that he wrote at that time, Psalm 51, 11 to 14 says, Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and the sinners will be converted to you. Deliver me from my blood guiltiness, O God, the Lord, the God of my salvation. Then my tongue will be joyfully sing of your righteousness. So he confessed, and the Lord forgave him, and he finished out his reign uh, with a good, close relationship with the Heavenly Father. He still suffered some of the consequences of that sin later on, as many of you know, but he at least restored that relationship that he had with the Holy Spirit, uh, through the Holy Spirit, <coughs> with God. <coughs> Excuse me. The prophet Joel, in Joel 2, 28, 29, says... It will come about in those days that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind. That's you and me. And your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. And your young men will see visions. 
Even the male and female servants, I will pour out my spirit on them in those days. So we have a hint of God's plan of pouring out his Holy Spirit to everyone. We know it had, didn't happen then, but this was prophesied by Joel. And we will see that when we get to Acts, what happened. Then in another case, an angel speaks to Zacharias about his coming son, John the Baptist. And this is during uh, the time when uh, John the Baptist was born and Jesus was born. We're in Luke, Luke chapter 1, verse 15 to 17. And Zacharias tells John the Baptist about this son who's going to be born to him. Uh, tells him about this son named, who will be named John, and he will be called John the Baptist. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he will drink no wine or liquor. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb, and he will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord. It is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So the Holy Spirit gives his father a revelation about him having a son, John the Baptist. And just about the same time as we know, the Holy Spirit speak uh, Holy Spirit speaks to Mary in Luke 1 35 the angel answered and said to her the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you and for that reason the Holy Child shall be then called the Son of God he was the Son of God because his father was the Holy Spirit and his mother was Mary who actually was a descendant of David as, as well as was Joseph, although Joseph was not the father. But it's the way the, whole, the Lord and the Holy Spirit works in our lives. And when he goes, he's going to do something major, he selects the people he wants to carry out that work. And he will select people who have the Holy Spirit in them, who are uh, true believers and love the Lord, and know that the Holy Spirit is working in them. In Luke 4, we hear, start hearing about Jesus um, and the Holy Spirit. Luke 4, 16, 21. He came to Nazareth and where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and he opened the book and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. You may be rich as you can be, but if you don't know the gospel, you are poor. If you don't know the Holy Spirit, you are poor. So he preaches the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind the captors are the ones that are captivated by their sin and separated from God because of that. To proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down and the eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This scripture was repeated out of Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. And he repeated it. He read it. And he says, this scripture of Isaiah's was fulfilled at that time. Now, the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, each one of them speak of Christ's baptism. But let me read the story of Christ's baptism in John chapter 1, verse 29 and 30.
John 1, 29 to 34. The next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he on behalf of whom I said, After me comes a man who has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. I did not recognize him, but so that he might be manifested in Israel, I came to baptize in wa by baptizing in water. John testified, saying, I have seen the Spirit descend as a dove out of heaven, and he remained upon him. I did not recognize him, recognize him I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water sent, sent to me. He upon whom you see the Spirit descend and remain upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. Now, John sees the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove come down on Jesus. And what we find here is that he is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Now, the baptism of the Holy Spirit didn't happen at this time. It doesn't happen until the book of Acts, we'll see. But the whole point is they, people had a relationship with the Holy Spirit, and they knew God, or hopefully they did. And hopefully they became to know Jesus Christ. But when Jesus Christ brings the Holy Spirit, as we'll see, that's when the church really begins to take off and the, the church is actually born. In John 3, verse 5 and 8, a man by the, a Pharisee by the name of Nicodemus comes to him at night in secret because uh, he's a Pharisee and he's heard these rumors about this man out there. They're healing people and teaching and healing on Sundays and doing all kinds of miracles and nobody knows who he is and Nicodemus comes to him in secret at night because he doesn't want the rest of his Pharisees to see him, right, with Jesus and Jesus, he asks Jesus and the first thing Jesus says to, to Nicodemus is truly, truly I say to you, unless one is born of the water and the spirit he cannot enter the kingdom of God that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and from where it's going. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Now that term, born again, was a term when I was growing up I had never heard in the church that I was in. And in fact, I didn't hear that until the time of Jimmy Carter, who ran for president years ago. And some of you that are old enough may remember the time when he was kind of ridiculed by the press because he said he was born, of, uh, he was, uh, born again. And that's the first time I'd ever heard it. That shows you how far away from the Lord I was at that time. Uh, but as time went on, and the more reading I did of the Bible and, and getting active in a good Bible teaching church, I learned what born, being born again was. Then in John 4, 22, Jesus goes out of his way on his way to Galilee. He goes out of his way through Samaria to, to have because he knows he has an appointment, at least the Holy Spirit has an appointment for him with this woman at the well. And in John 4, 22, he says to the woman, you worship what you do not know, and we worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshiper will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people... The Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So we're here at church worshiping, and the question we ask ourselves is, do we worship spirit in spirit and truth? 
Do we individually pray and worship in spirit and truth? And I hope the answer to all your questions to yourself is yes, because the Holy Spirit is part of the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and He is that relationship we have with God always if He is in us, if we are born again. John 7, 37 to 39, Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit again, and he says, it says, Now in the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood out and cried, saying, If anyone is thirsty, to him let him come to me and drink. He who, in, who believes in me, as the scripture sh said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. By this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For the Spirit was not given yet, because Jesus had not yet been glorified. He's warning them and telling them that they need to be born of the Spirit. And they probably didn't know what he was telling them, because that didn't happen yet. And he couldn't tell them that, because he had not been glorified yet. It wasn't until after he was crucified and resurrected that he actually sent the Holy Spirit, as we'll see. But he warns them that it's important. Then we go to the latter part of John, starting in chapter 14. Jesus is with his disciples and he's telling them, going to tell them about him sending the Holy Spirit. He tells them this four different times in these scriptures. John 14, 16 through 17. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see him or know him. But you know him, because he abides in you and will be in you. The world does not know him. And we are all part of the world, and at one time none of us knew him. But he will be in us. He is tells us and we will know him you know one of the things about the Holy Spirit is and everybody you may not realize this because but because at some point hopefully you all have all become Christians but prior to that time the Holy Spirit was with you in your mind trying to bring you closer and closer to him so you understood you didn't believe in God you didn't believe in Jesus but the Holy Spirit was there working on you from the time you could understand until the time you became a born-again Christian. He was there drawing you to him, bringing you, trying to do everything he could to get you to come to become a Christian, putting people in your life who are Christians who would share the gospel with you and doing that, things like that because he loves each one of us so much. He created all of us. He loves us with a love beyond what we can understand. And he wants each one of us, each one of us, to be one of his followers, one of his believers. And when we aren't, it breaks his heart. But he does everything he can, putting the Holy Spirit around us and in our lives until we actually come to know him. It's so important, this Holy Spirit. Then a little bit later in John 14, Jesus says again to his disciples, These things I have spoken to you while abiding with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things, and being, bring to remembrance all that I have said to you. This is really important if you think about it. He's talking to his disciples, and they've been with him by this time about three years Pretty much all the time, he's heard all of his little, all of his messages, he's seen, seen his miracles. There's so much, I mean, he, they've been overloaded with information about Jesus. How are they going to remember this to tell everybody? Well, Jesus here tells them, he says, the Holy Spirit will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I have said to you. That book in your hand, if you bring your Bible, is God's word given to people who believed in him by the Holy Spirit. And without that, 
word of God, uh, we wouldn't have God in our hearts. Moving on to John 16, verse 27, he tells them a third time, when the helper comes, whom I will send you from the Father, that is the spirit of truth, who, proceed, who, who proceeds from the Father, the Holy Spirit comes from the Father, he will testify about me. And you will testify also because you have been with me from the beginning. And then the, finally, the fourth time, John 16, 12 to 15, he says, I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. He's telling them he's kind of overloaded them with information, I think, and they're not understanding it completely yet. But he says, but when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whoever hears, he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me, and he will take mine, take, will take of mine, and will disclose to you. Four times Jesus was telling his disciples to expect the, the Holy Spirit. And then, of course, we know that he told them to wait, to wait. And this he was telling them before his arrest and his trial and his crucifixion and his resurrection. But after his resurrection, he met with them by the Sea of Galilee. And in Matthew 28, verses 16 to 20, here's what Jesus told them. But the eleven disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority have been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I command you. And, lo, I am with you always even to the ends of the earth. There he says it, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. God, Jesus reaffirms this trinity that we're talking about today. Then in Acts, Chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. It's 50 days after Christ's resurrection. And it's a, really an interesting story there because back in the time of Moses in the Le Leviticus, Moses wrote about the feasts that the Lord dictated to Israel. The Passover the Feast of First Fruits, fruits uh, and several other ones. The Feast of eleven, Unleavened Bread, and then the Feast of Weeks. And interestingly enough, this was 1,400 years before this time. 1,400 years, Moses is writing this as the Holy Spirit is dictating to him these feasts. And these feasts, we've heard about them, especially Passover. We all know where they are. They're not a major thing, but it's, um, it's really interesting how this works because the Passover they're celebrating because it was celebrating their leaving Egypt. That was a biggie, and that was huge for the Israelites. Then the Feast of Unleavened Bread was to celebrate the week for a week beginning on the first 15th of Nisan, which was starting a day after Passover. And then the first fruits of, of was celebrated on the 16th of Nisan, which was uh, the, first, the feast of the first fruits. And then the feast of weeks was Pentecost, which was 50 days after first fruits. Now these were all established 1400 years before Christ's crucifixion and resurrection. And now, here we have Acts 15. But 
let me before we talk about that, let me let me mention these these feasts again. So here are these fe five four feasts established fourteen hundred years previous by Moses, written in Leviticus. The Passover Jesus celebrated with his disciples the night of his betrayal, and that day that day. Jewish days start at sunset, so they're on into the Friday, if you will. And then the Feast of Unleavened Bread speaks of no sin. They left the leaven out of the bread because leaven was, was, was uh, a symbol of sin. And they're supposed to celebrate that for seven days. And who, does have, who had no sin? Only one man ever had no sin Jesus Christ obviously and then the feast of first fruits was on the 16th of Nisan and guess who was resurrected on the first fruits the day of first fruits Jesus Christ was resurrected on that day and then 50 days from first fruits you counted to the to the feast of weeks seven weeks plus one 50 weeks and guess what day that was? That was the day that Acts 2, verse 1 to 4 starts, and that's the birth of the church, and that's the start of the title, Pentecost. And it says, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting, and there appeared to them tongues of fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit was given them utterance. Now that's amazing. 1,400 years ago in Levi Leviticus, Moses tells about this schedule of feasts. And God's plan was those feasts were really fulfilled at the time of Christ's crucifixion. He was the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. His resurrection and, and everything falls into place. It's just an amazing, amazing plan of God who, and it was fulfilled then. Here's another thing that happened back in Deuteronomy, which was also written 1,400 years before. Deuteronomy 16, 16 says, Three times a year all the males shall appear before the Lord of God in the place which he chooses, as the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Feast of Weeks, and at the Feast of Booths, and they shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. So he had established this rule where the men of Israel, in most cases their families came too, uh, hopefully, so that they were supposed to be in Israel on this fifth of weeks. So there were a lot of extra visitors in, in Jerusalem during that time to celebrate this Pentecost day. So that the truth was God wanted as many people there as possible so they could hear and see about this filling of the Holy Spirit that uh, we find in Pentecost. So now we have God's plan being fulfilled through Jesus Christ, and now we know that God is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And now with the Holy Spirit, the gospel begins to spread. In Acts 8, 14 to 17, we're told, now when the apostles in Jerusalem heard from that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them, that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen upon them. They had simply been baptized in the name of Jesus. Then they began laying their hands on them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit begins to fall on the Gentiles. There's a story in Acts 10 about uh, a Gentile by the name of uh, Cornelius was became baptized with the Holy Spirit. He wasn't a Jew. He was a Gentile. 
And he was the first Gentile that was buried, uh, was, uh, uh, was baptized. So this is another one of those amazing stories because Cornelius lived in, lived in Caesarea and he was a godly man. And the Holy Spirit came to him and he said, I want you to go down to Joppa, which is 30 miles away, Joppa, and ask for a man named Peter and have him come and preach to you. And as he sent his men down to Joppa, which is probably two days, three day walking journey back then, Peter has this vision of this giant sheet coming down filled with all kinds of animals and reptiles, etc., etc. And God, uh, God tells him, the Lord tells him, kill and eat. And Peter said, no, no, it's not allowed. You know, I'm a Jew. We can't do that. We, these are all non-kosher animals, etc., etc. And amazingly, he says, God says, What God has cleansed, no longer consider unholy. So that gives Peter an idea of, hmm, maybe I need to think about some of our rules, like uh, not worrying about what I'm eating because it's not kosher, and maybe even thinking about sharing the gospel with unkosher people. And just as he has seen that vision, these three guys from... Caesarea, or who was sent down to get Peter, knock on the door. And so we find that uh, the three men from Caesarea show up, and the Spirit of God tells Peter, go with, go with them and share the gospel message to Cornelius. So Peter goes and shares and preaches to Cornelius and others in his family. He was a high official in the Roman government, and there was a lot of people there as well as his family. And in Acts 10, 44 to 48, we see that while Peter was still speaking these words, he is preaching to Cornelius now, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. All these circumcised believers who came with Peter, because a lot of people were traveling around with Peter because he was doing amazing things and they liked to be with him. So they went with Peter and they were all circumcised because they were Jewish and they were amazed. And because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on a Gentile also, this was kind of a first. They didn't understand it. You know, we're Jews. You know, God's our, our God. He's not anybody else's God. But then they see this evidence that these people receive the Holy Spirit. For they are hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God. Then Peter answered, Surely no one can refuse the water for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did. And he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and they asked him to stay for a few days. The Holy Spirit was at work in all of those people. The believing Jews who believed in Jesus, all of a sudden now they realize they're supposed to accept non-Jews into the church. And then, of course, these non-believers became believers uh, who were Roman citizens and not believers at all, except we're told that uh, the one the one man was was a godly man. In Acts thirteen one to four, we're told while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit. Okay. Fell on all those who were listening to the message. All the circumcised believers who came with Peter were amazed. I just read that. I'm sorry. Acts 13, 1 to 4. Now there were at Antioch, in a church, there was prophets and teachers. Barnabas and Simeon, were, who, were called, who was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene and Manaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And then they 
when they fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So Paul and Barnabas left. They went down to Seleucia, and from there they boarded a ship and sailed to Cyprus. And that was the beginning of Paul's first missionary journey. The Holy Spirit got him started. Paul now compares living under the law versus living by the Holy Spirit. In Romans 7, 5 and 6, Paul says, For while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. But now we have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve in newness of the Spirit, not in oldness of the letter. Paul, as you probably know, remember, was a very religious Pharisee, very highly trained Pharisee of Pharisees, he said he was. And he lived by the law, by the law. Well, after the Lord came to, to, to Paul, he changed and became a believer of Christ. And then he re writes this in this uh, uh, letter in Romans. We serve now in a newness of the spirit, not the oldness of the letter, which refers to the oldness of the law. We serve the spirit. Our victory is in Christ, and we long, no longer live under the law. So the Spirit fills Christians if they're believers. And He's filled each one of you, I hope. And if you're not sure, I encourage you to talk with Pastor Ron or me or Juan or some of the other strong believers in this church and and help them ask them to clarify because most most people uh, a lot of the people in this church know know these things and they will help you to understand and, and pray with you and help you to receive the Holy Spirit if you haven't if you don't have the Holy Spirit in you Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 3 16 do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in in you Look around you in this church. There are, there are people here who are temples of God. Most of you, I hope. You are a temple of God. You're part of the church, and you are God's temple. You know, and it goes back to that scripture we read earlier uh, where Jesus was talking to the talking to the, guy, the lady at the well. And he said, well, I don't find it here, but he's, he said, you will someday, uh, you won't go to the temple to, to worship the God because the temple is in you. And wherever you are, you're the temple of God and you can worship God wherever. The Holy Spirit gave us gifts. Each one of us gifts. And if you go through the Bible in, in the New Testament, Paul mentions about 20 different gifts in three of his letters. And I want to read the first Corinthians letter, chapter 12, verse 4 to 14, where he lists a few of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, there are a variety of gifts, but one spirit. And there are a variety of ministries in the same Lord. There are a variety of of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given a manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Each one of you, as a Christian, has been given a gift from God. Some of you may know what your gift is, some of you may not. For to one is given the word of wisdom of the Spirit, and another the word of knowledge to the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gift of healings to a Spirit, to another the effects of miracles, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, and, and another interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these, distributing to each one individually as he wills. And he does this 
to build up his church throughout the world. And I've just listed 10 of them, but there's a lot that are left out. Pastoring, ministering, teaching, all those are gifts. He says, he goes on to say, for even as the body is one and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we all are baptized into one body, the body of Christ, God's church, Christ's church. Whether Jews or Greeks or American or Hawaiian or, or Texan or New Mexican or Filipino or whatever, we're all baptized into one body. Slave or free, we're all made to drink of one spirit, for the body is one member, but many. So I'd encourage all of you, if you don't have an idea what your gifts of the spirit are, uh, maybe we'll have an opportunity to hold a little class on that sometime here. I've done that a number of times in, in Albuquerque, and, and uh, it's an interesting, very simple, easy easy thing to do. Galatians 4, 6, and 7 says, Because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. You're God's son and daughter. I hope you know that. But if you don't, you are God's son and daughter. And if you believe in him and He's put you here on earth to live and to learn, kind of like you go into the army, you go to boot camp. This is boot camp for eternity. But the thing is, this 70 or 80 year boot camp is pretty tough. But it's nothing, nothing compared to an eternity with God in heaven, in paradise. So keep that in mind and don't, don't get discouraged. Sometimes we get discouraged. I certainly do. Because you're sons of God. I just read that. I'm sorry. So the deeds of the flesh versus fruits of the spirit. There are things that unbelievers do and some th even things that we still do even as believers that are not good. But there's also good things. Galatians 5, 16 to 24 says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit. The flesh is anti-Spirit, I guess you could say. And the Spirit against the flesh, for these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. If you're led by the Spirit, the, the Spirit is going to keep you from breaking any law. He will help you. Now the deeds, of, the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are many. And he lists them here. Immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envy, and drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you before, that those practices will not uh, inherit the kingdom of God. They're sinful. We know what they are. We know what sin is. We're all tempted by them. But, Paul goes on to say, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Those are the things of the Spirit. The Spirit gives us when we have the Holy Spirit in us. He gives us those fruits of the Spirit. And against such things, there is no law because they're all good in God's eyes. Now those who belong to Jesus Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit and by the fruit of the Spirit. Ephesians 4.30 
tells us, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. When we sin, we grieve the Holy Spirit. Elsewhere in the Bible it says, Don't quench the Holy Spirit. Peter in 2, 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21 says, But you know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, for no prophecy has ever made was ever made by an act of human will, but of men moved by the Holy Spirit, spoke from God. That Bible that you have is God-inspired. It's not man-made, written in any form. Moses didn't write it. Matthew, Mark, Luke didn't write it. It was all inspired by the Holy Spirit. Yes, they, they moved the pencil on the paper, but it's all inspired. One last question, and we'll clip conclude. Luke 11, 11, verse 9 through 13 says, So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. But everyone who seeks and asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Would you like to have a more, more of the Holy Spirit in you? You have the Holy Spirit, but would you like to have more? Well, here's what Jesus says. Now suppose that one of your fathers is asked by the son for a fish, and he will not give him a snake instead of a fish, or will he? Or if he asks for an egg, will he not give him a scorpion, or will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give Holy Spirit, give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? If you want more of the Holy Spirit, go to prayer of the Lord. He says, Jesus says, ask him, and you will receive. To close, I'd like to read 2 Corinthians 13, 11 to 14. Finally, brethren, rejoice, be made complete, be comforted, be like-minded, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you forever. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.
Before we go, I want to remind you of just one thing tied together. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. The Father gave the Son, that you and I might have fellowship, be reconciled to him. But when Jesus Christ went back to be with the Father, sit at the right hand, continually interceding for you and me. He gave us the comforter, the Holy Spirit that would lead us in all truth. He convicts the world of their sin. They'll either receive him or reject him. The choice is yours. Father, thank you for today. Thank you that we're reminded of the Trinity, that you are love. Father, you are love, that Jesus, you are love, and the Holy Spirit is love. When one is working, they're all working. Father, just take control of our lives as we go out today, that we would be a blessing every place we go, that we would bring your fragrance to a lost world. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful week of the Lord.